right, salam everyone. This is Amiya, and we don't have a lot of people here, but that's okay. We're going to just do it anyway. So, we're going to go through some of the differences in the book of Genesis. I think a lot of the differences are very interesting. And by going through this, even if some of the differences seem not that significant, the fact is these differences do uh, prove that the scribes have changed things and that's a significant thing because that's going to affect our faith especially if we're appealing to the bible for our beliefs so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, i'm going to highlight some of these differences so we're going to start all the way just in genesis chapter one now I have a Samarit Israelite Samaritan version of the Torah with me, and that prints the Masoretic text of English translation on the right side and the Samaritan on the left side, and it highlights the different some of those differences. So here's an example of one of the differences in chapter one. In verse 14, it reads in the Masoretic text. And Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now the Samaritan says the same thing, except it says, so it says, Let there be lights in the expanse or in the firmament of the heaven to light the earth and separate or divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Um, so that's it. the extra clause that's missing in our copies is the phrase to light the earth and the, uh, so to light the earth. And what's also interesting is that uh, in the Septuagint, I'm pretty sure, from what I remember, is that the Septuagint has that same extra clause. So those are two witnesses suggesting that our copies of Genesis have shortened things. And the reason they shorten things, I believe, is because some of those details, if they remove them, you don't lose too much of the meaning of the passage, uh, in their mind anyway. And so there's just so many examples like that where you, it seems more likely that they've removed those words rather than adding them. Now let's see. That's, for the most part, those are the differences in the Samaritan, but the Septuagint kind of has its own unique differences. So for example, are you guys familiar with the fact that for each of the six days of creation, in the Samaritan and the Masoretic text, it uh, only five of those six days does the creator say and he uh, or does the torah say and he saw that it was good only five of those six days one of those days the creation on that day it's not specified to be good uh so some scholars think oh well the scribe must have added that in because he saw that as a flaw and he wanted to fix the flaw of the torah i, I suppose that's a possibility or as i believe the uh, the scribes accidentally removed that clause, and because the, if if the Torah is in fact inspired by Yahuwah, then it's gonna be flawless, right? It's gonna it's not gonna have errors or things missing, and so we know that everything he created was good because on the I think it was on at the very end of Genesis one or maybe the beginning of chapter two it says and he saw everything that he made and he saw that it was very good including so everything he made so that would include the day that apparently he skipped over and and didn't say was good which you so i think there's a strong case to be made that the the uh septuagint's reading there is correct now here's another interesting extra clause is um it says let's see it's in verse nine so we read, we go to verse 9 of chapter 1 of Genesis, and I'll read it. It says, And Elohim said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered 
together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Okay. But the Septuagint says, and uh, it, after it says, and it was so, it says, and the water which was under the heaven was collected into its places, and the dry land appeared. And then it goes on into the next verse in the Masoretic and Septuagint, it says, and Elohim called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And Elohim saw that it was good. It just seems to me that the scribes would be more likely to remove that extra specification as an unnecessary detail because it's conveying the basic point that he created it, uh, the dry land, and it, it appeared. So the, I, I have a hard time seeing why the scribes would add that extra uh, specification. But that extra specification also fits very well with the the other verses in Genesis chapter 1 where it says almost the same type of thing for the other things that he created. Uh, it uses the same type of structure of the passages. So the Septuagint's extra reading I find to be compelling and then also we must note that the Septuagint, uh, excuse me not Septuagint, the Dead Sea Scrolls has some fragments of Genesis and there is at least one fragment which corresponds the Septuagint with that extra uh, clause of the Septuagint. So we have multiple, multiple witnesses there. Also the Dead Sea Scrolls corroborates and confirms that extra clause that I mentioned a little bit earlier, the first one uh, from verse 14, which is the extra words were to light the earth. That's in Dead Sea Scrolls as well. So we've got actually three witnesses for that uh, extra reading. So it's just some really uh, good points there of some changes. Now let's see what else. Then we've got... Uh, so in verse 12 we, we see... And the earth brought forth... This is Masoretic text. And the earth... And, and the Samaritan as well. And the earth brought forth grass, herb, yielding seed after its kind, and tree bearing fruit. Wherein is the seed thereof uh, after its kind? And Elohim saw that it was good. Now, the Septuagint adds a couple extra things. It says, so let's see, bearing fruit after its kind and according to its likeness, as the words, and according to its likeness. Um, and then it says, it also adds, it, it adds that same clause in the previous verse too, in verse 11. And then at the end of the verse, where it says, um, hold on, it says, after its kind, substitution adds, on the earth. And God saw that it was good. So we were seeing here many examples of the Septuagint just having extra details. Let's see. Here's another one of verse 20. Let's see. Verse 20, it says, And Elohim said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let fowl fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Septuagint adds, and it was so. Again, that is a... Uh, it seems like that's needed for the, the passage. Uh, it, fits, it fits the theme of that chapter. It fits the, the structure. So I believe that the Septuagint's fuller readings are more authentic and that the, that the uh, scribes were removing certain details because they felt that it weren't necessary. And sometimes they may have even made mistakes too, accidentally removing things when they didn't realize. They skipped it over. Let's see. Uh, verse 28. It says in Masoretic and Samaritan, And Elohim blessed them, and Elohim said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, 
and over every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. Septuagint says, uh, let's see. Hold on. I might have rendered that incorrectly. I'm not sure of it. So I'm going to skip that, actually, just in case I don't want to make an error there. So now let, I'm going to go to chapter 2 because this one is very interesting. It says, in the Masoretic text, it says, And on the seventh day, Elohim finished his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. In the Septuagint, it says, and on the sixth day, Elohim finished his work. In the Samaritan, it says, and on the sixth day. So the Samaritan and Septuagint, it's two witnesses there. And uh, let's see. It does not have, you know, Dead Sea Scrolls there. Oh, good. We're going through Genesis. We're going through some of the differences. So uh, basically what I just told them is... We're in chapter, chapter 2 of Genesis, comparing some of the differences, and we see right here, the Masoretic says, On the seventh day, Elohim finished his work, and he rested on the seventh day. It makes it sound like he was still working on the seventh day and then finished on the seventh day. Whereas the Septuagint version of Genesis and the Samaritan version, they both together say he finished his work on the sixth day. And then he rested on the seventh. So I believe the scribes made an error there and accidentally said seven. I did a thing on Facebook recently where I showed some examples of discrepancies that the scribes did between the number six and seven. And that could that could also have to do with the fact that they start their day. Wait, hold on. Uh, it's not going to pick pick you up. Uh, Jackson said, so you're going to have to hold it when you want to say something. Okay, I was saying that that may have. To do with the fact that they start their days at evening or at um, at sunset, and that just kind of plays into the fact that they were trying to they had or they had um, what's the word I'm looking for? And it, not necessarily an agenda. They had a uh, they're trying to present it in their point of view. Yeah, they're trying to interpret it. It's yeah. Oh yes, you can. Okay, looks like we're gonna get. Looks, oh. Yes. But, uh, oh, no, no, don't worry. Are we so? Are we getting more people or? or? Okay. Well, we're just gonna continue, and then for people who keep coming, they'll walk on in. Cause there'll be more to share. Oh no, that's that's okay. It was very confusing today. Uh, you know all the different stuff going on. It's okay. Yeah, you could sit anywhere you want. If more people come, we'll get some more chairs for people. So if anyone wants to make a comment, you're going to have to say, I'd like to comment, and then I'm going to have to hand you this because uh, Jackson said that this is not going to pick up what people are saying unless they have it close to them. Hopefully it's going to pick up what I'm saying here. Maybe I'm not close enough, but I think I am. So... <laughs> If not, it's okay. It's all in my head anyway, so I can always redo some of the stuff in the future if it doesn't get recorded for some reason. So, uh, basically, we just discussed uh, how the Masoretic text that we're familiar with in Genesis chapter 2 says, he, Yahuwah, or you know, it's Elohim, finished, finished creating on the seventh day. And then he rested on the seventh day. Whereas the Septuagint and the Samaritan, they both together, two witnesses say, he finished his work on the sixth day, and then he rested on the seventh. So uh, it seems th there's also other examples in scripture where there's corruptions between six and seven, discrepancies. So it seems like the Masoretic text that we're familiar with is wrong in, in a key verse like this. And there's, there's many other examples which we will be going through. So... Uh, here's some, another interesting example is in verse 4 of chapter 2 the the Masoretic text says Elohim made earth and heavens 
uh, Samaritan says Elohim made heavens and earth. So it just switches it, but basically it's just showing that there's even differences in the word orders of the passages. Now let's see. What was that verse in four? That, that, four? that was, yeah, that was the verse four. There's chapter word order difference. Four, cha not chapter four? Well, it's, it's chapter two, verse four. Oh. Yeah. Now, um, then we were going to see here, it's like, why would scribes change this? So here's an example. It says, in verse 12 of Masoretic Text, it says, And the gold of that land is good. There is bdellium and the onyx stone. You guys are familiar with that verse? It's in Genesis chapter 2. In the Samaritan, it says, and the gold of that land is very good. Uh, and then it, the rest of it. So it adds the extra word very. Would scribes have a motivation to add the word very? Like, what would be the point of that? Like, it, uh, I don't know. It seems to me like it doesn't make sense. So it seems like perhaps the scribes removed the very because they didn't want people to think that, you know, they didn't want people to put too much focus on gold being, like, a very special thing, you know, because there's some people are greedy for money. So perhaps the scribes were scribes were concerned that if the scriptures were saying the gold is very good, then people might be desiring of gold more than they should be. Yeah, I don't it's know. It's only good for them. You want to say it? No. Okay. Um, yeah, let's see. There's other minor differences sometimes in the Hebrew. Uh, of the Ma of the Masoretic versus the Samaritan, but I'm not going to be covering all of them. So here is another. Here's an interesting example. The Septuagint agrees with the Samaritan on this. So here's what it has. It says, "And the man said, so this is Masoretic text. And the man said, verse 23, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman because she was taken out of a man." Uh -huh. Hi. Hi. Daniel or? No, this is Yokanan. Yokanan Rodman, nice to meet you. Hello, Robin. Nice to meet you. Sorry, I'm interrupting. Uh, that's okay. I'm Jeannie. Hi. 2.23. Yeah, we're, we're going through Genesis and comparing differences uh, in the manuscripts of Genesis. So. So it says, she shall be called a woman because she was taken out of a man. That is what our copies, we will read that in our copies. In the Samaritan copies, which are also Hebrew, and the Septuagint, it says, and Adam said this, uh, it basically says the same thing up until the end. It says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman because she was taken out of her man. So the one is because she was taken out of a man, and here it's because she was taken out of her man. Now when you look at the Hebrew, the word for man is ish, or different pronunciations people have, but you know, ish. The word for woman is isha. Now the, the, own, the main difference between the two is the addition of the 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 hay at the end uh, yes and the the hay at the end uh, basically makes it feminine it means she or her and but according to the what the Samaritan Septuagint are saying it's saying that uh, it's saying that woman was named after the fact that she was taken out of her man rather than just just the feminine version of the name it's actually like a name meaning just like you know Isaac why was Isaac named Isaac because of the laughter you know so it's giving more depth in the Septuagint and Samaritan there's other chairs we can, or there's at least one chair over there but. okay <laughs> so 
I'm not doing Temple Scroll today. I wasn't sure if people were coming, and I think you said you were originally planning on... You can do whatever you want, yeah. as long as you start over from the beginning. Uh, <laughs> 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 we're going through Genesis and Good. comparing okay. the differences. Cool. And so let's see here. I have a question, because I know you already went along, and I apologize for that. You have to speak into this, otherwise it won't hear you. When it talks about the beginning, creation, Mm -hmm. What do you what do you see about the day? Is it even to even or evening? You know what I'm saying? Because you know, in rabbinical Judaism, they say the day starts at night. Yeah. What have you found? Um, well, I used to believe in. I changed my view a, a while ago to sunrise to sunrise, but then eventually I changed it back. To sunset to sunset okay. but when i was believing sunrise to sunrise view i could reconcile those passages it seemed all to work and make sense so i guess just from my own experience i can see how people can uh read the torah and come to the conclusion of a sunrise to sunrise day okay okay um but as i said i i believe uh in sunset to sunset day but from my own experience, I understand the perspective, and I think. So, why do you, how have you become more of a sunset to sunset? Uh, just reading other scriptures, uh, there are certain passages which seem to uh, point to a sunset to sunset reckoning, in my understanding. But uh, as I said, I think I think the, the the Hebrew text of the Torah could be interpreted either way. I don't okay. think. I, like I, I would not appeal to Genesis and say, ah, oh, yeah, here's proof that I'm right, okay. that it's sunset to sunset. I don't think it's a compelling case that I can make from Genesis alone. Uh, so what about the feast? Uh, what about the feasts? But like even Passover, because Passover says at sunset is when you're supposed to kill the lamb and eat of it. So if it's if it's sunset to sunset, then. In reality, it's unleavened bread when they left. Um, let's see. I, I, I think, I, yeah, sure, but you guys want to, we should try to find a seat if you're wanting to participate or what's going on. Okay. To uh, answer your question, though, what I believe is what tells you sunset to sunset. Uh, it's very specific. You can't get around it. Okay. Uh, I'm a dawn to it. To you know, dawn to, well, dawn to dust person, so I don't, I can't accept that Jubilees is an error, but that's one of your big proofs of a sunset if you accept it. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, you, there's a chair right there. Uh, uh, we gonna, oh, yeah, um, I was just going to say that Passover and, um, and, well, Passover is sunset, right? And then there's another feast that's commanded to start at sunset. Is that Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur. But um, then at sunrise, it starts um, on leavened bread. So the the sunset of the 14th is when uh, Pesach starts. So the 14th ends that day. And then the 15th day is when um, unleavened bread starts. Well, first of all, the, the scripture says that the Passover lamb is to be slain between the evenings. And that's an interesting phrase because it never really explains in the Bible what that means. So we're kind of left to try to speculate what does that mean. And Elijah gives us a clue. Elijah? Yeah. Elijah has to pray between the evenings in it when he does the, um, when he's competing with the Baal prophets. That passage uses the same thing. From there, we can get an idea, but, yeah. Okay, uh, and just... Elijah, when, yeah. he, when he's fighting the Baal prophets and raining down water, he uses the same phrase between the evenings in that context. And it's um, after Baal does their stuff, then he does his between the evenings. Okay. So Sec I was going to say... First I can't give you the Kings. address for it, but Thank I can you. give you the context. Second Kings? Yeah, one of those. Uh, Elijah's not even mentioned in Chronicles, but um, uh, just so you guys know, if you want to say something, apparently Jackson said that 
like this uh, thing that's covering this apparently is blocking out a lot of sound so you're going to have to hold this if you want to say something so that it can be recorded unless you don't want it to be recorded then you could still ask the question and my answer will be recorded but your question won't be heard um, you can repeat the question. yeah and i can also yeah i can repeat the question um let's see so from what i understand between the evenings the lamb was to be slain then from what I understand, the Torah says you are to eat the lamb during the night. Do you guys agree with that yeah. understanding? During the night. And then when it's dawn or slightly before morning or, you know, basically either at sunset, I mean sunrise or shortly before sunrise, something around there, it says you're to destroy the remaining lamb not to be in. It's polluted. Then after... Once it's daytime, that was when they left Egypt. So they did not leave Egypt uh, during the night. Now, uh, are you guys saying in your understanding that uh, they left on the first day of unleavened bread? Is that what you guys... Uh, is also my understanding that's, that th that's the case. And uh, I consider the 15th to be the first day of unleavened bread. Um, when I was following the, the sunrise to sunrise view, the way it was commanded for Passover was making sense to me, and I was able to reconcile that stuff too with it. So I think, again, with the Passover stuff, you probably could make a compelling case just on Torah alone for both interpretations, okay. I believe. Okay. Um, Let's see. So I'm going to go right, yeah. right in the beginning of Genesis. It says, uh, and he called the light day, and the, and the darkness he called night. night. So yeah. I don't, you know, I don't know if he's distinguishing between the two. And, in the order, but it seems to it seems to suggest that the day light part is day, or the light part is day, and the darkness is night. Um, yeah, so you said basically that because it says in Genesis chapter 1, uh, just he called the, uh, the, for the light day and for the darkness night. Uh, there is, there is a, a fragment in the Dead Sea Scrolls which may or may not be uh, a piece of evidence uh, in a different direction where it basically that same passage, instead of saying it called the day Yom, it says called the day Yomam or or Yomam. It's related to the same word, but it either it means something like uh, daytime or daily or something. But you know, you could you could do some research on that particular word. If it ha does it even have any difference between Yom or is there is there a difference? Because if the original reading was Yomam or Yomam, and it has a difference between Yom, then that argument would not be as compelling. But what I do find a good argument, an interesting argument, is when it speaks of uh, uh, days and nights, like 40 days and 40 nights type of thing. So it's making a, a distinction there. Right. Uh, and as I said, I, I used to believe, uh, subscribe to that viewpoint, so I still have a, a lot of that uh, perspective in my understanding so I, I can relate to those ideas. Um, so I, I think you could I'm make... Not, I, I'm, not, I'm not being dogmatic, I don't know. Yeah. I just, you know... Well, as we talked, there's a lot of corruptions in Scripture so it makes it hard to discern what the Scripture was intending to mean due to those differences. But that's something we have to try to figure out together. And we, I think we should encourage uh, criticism of each person's ideas and testing each person's ideas, seeing if it all reconciles together. Um, I don't claim to be super knowledgeable on a lot of stuff, but I do consider myself to be an expert on when a day starts. I've done probably 100 hours worth of work. What do you do? You want to? Yeah. Uh, careful of the two top top okay. I don't claim to know tons of stuff, but if I do know one thing, it's when a day start. When a day starts, in my opinion, I've probably put in a hundred hours worth of research in this one topic, and I've got a pretty lengthy document that you're willing to have. If you just let me know, I can give it to you, or 
we can go over all these questions and I can show you the proofs on them all if you I say, I say a day starts at dawn, it ends at dusk, it's 12 hours long, and the night is something completely different. Uh, yeah, that's what and, I that's what and a night is measured by hours, or, or I'm sorry, a night is measured by watches, yeah. and a day is measured by hours. Yeah. And um, this concept of a 24-hour day is a fairly modern thing. Agreed. And uh, I, 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 so I that's my position. I can... And I can answer every critique for all the feasts on why they start when they do and how it still endorses um, a day perspective starting at dawn. And um, I've not found one single scriptural evidence that cannot be interpreted either way that goes against a day. So in other words, in a hundred, and uh, I think it's a hundred or three hundred, I can't remember, hundred plus verses nevertheless, I've not found one scripture that uh, can only be interpreted that a day starts at evening. And um, I found seven verses that can be interpreted that a day would start at evening or dawn. And I'm fairly convinced that the dawn is the better interpretation, but I wouldn't give you a hard time for those seven verses. And then there's over a hundred that are indisputable. There's only one way to interpret them, and it starts at dawn. Yeah. It's... it's the document is already hosted in the Vero Yihad. You can search for it there. But if you can't find it, you can email me. It's called Hayom. Hayom. Okay. Thank you. I'm not a theologian, but I know in Hebrew it says, Be'yikara Elohim la'oyom ve'ehoshikara laila. Y'all, in Elohim called the, 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 Be'yikara Elohim la'oyom ve'ehoshikara laila. Yom, day, ve'ehoshikara laila. And then in the darkness he called night. Night. Hallelujah. Yeah. And Yeshua says, That's like verse, verse 4. The same thing. He says, he says we should all work while well, well, it's still day. It's right. because night, night is coming in the darkness. He also calls it day 12 hours. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. The, the hard it. part is like, I mean, I totally believe in the redaction of all these scriptures. So, like, who knows whose agenda got pumped into certain right. things too? But I love that evidence. 100 to 7 is pretty compelling. Yeah, and the 7 is only that it could be interpreted either way. It's not an endorsement on a That's night position. Exactly and one other thing, Job mocks the idea of a day starting at night. And oh, really? it's either in 10, 12, or 14, one of those chapters, he mocks the idea. That's you awesome. can't get around it. I never saw that. Yeah. Well, the we thing saw, about the Passover yeah. thing. It, it's like, because if you follow a rabbinical calendar, if night starts at sundown, and that was, that's why I said about Passover, it doesn't work out. Because how can... You're either doing it on the 13th, the 14th, going to the 14th, right. and, and that the 14th means you have the to the 15th. Eat, and that means you have to eat unleavened bread for the first meal of the day, the and then you can follow having that's as right. much leaven as you want. That's right. Or it means you're eating the Passover on the 15th day, yeah. and that's not where it commands. No, and great. that's where it's like, to me, it just was confusing. But anyway, sorry. No, it's all right. Yeah, because I know you're trying to... you're. We kind of got involved. No, know. that's okay. I, 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 want, I want to be quiet and let you get <laughs> all information so and download yeah. it. I got it. Yeah, no, uh, I think I'd be happy to discuss with you guys and study together what Matthew's talking about. We can look through the verses together if you guys want sometime this week. Yeah. So anyways, you're going through Genesis. Going through Genesis and yeah, showing some of the... Yeah. And you're at 23? Uh, no, yeah, I was only in chapter oh, 2. Okay. <laughs> we might not get that far, but it's okay. But basically, also, earlier today, this isn't on recording, but we went, we went through Ezra chapter 2 and Nehemiah chapter 7, and we showed some crazy differences okay. between the numbers in our copies of the Bible, which clearly show the Old Testament has been corrupted in, in certain passages. Uh, so let's see here. Now here's another interesting difference is the Samaritan and Masoretic texts differ. They're both in Hebrew and the, the Masoretic text says the man. Usually it will refer to Adam as the man, like it has a hay in front of it. Yeah, it, it says, it says uh, like the hay in front of it, ha, or, and then Adam. In the Samaritan it doesn't have the haze usually. 
So it's basically implying or interpreting it as he's being addressed by name, as Adam. So that's another interesting difference of where that just that one letter changes it from just a reference to the man well, to right because because a name cannot have a definite article uh, it cannot have the you you um, the the yeah the yeah, onia yeah, you know, it's, it's, we don't, we don't to yeah so, <laughs> so that's just well, interesting we yes, yes the scribe because so, it's yeah. not a name um, so let's see chapter two any differences here to to go through okay nothing special here wait oh there is one thing um so you prefer the septuagint than the masoretic um the majority of the time okay. but there are some cases where i think the masoretic is more reliable than the septuagint okay. um but the Dead Sea Scrolls would chunk both of them. Yes, I believe the Dead Sea Scrolls is the chief authority over all other witnesses. But what would, it depends on where you're looking, because you wouldn't know which book. Yeah, for for for. Uh, you missed his teaching last night. Oh, Very sorry. Nice. For for uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, it has copies of each uh, of many different books from the Old Testament, and I believe that the Dead Sea Scrolls copies they're the, they're the oldest copies of the books of the Bible that we have. And I think the readings that they reflect are much more trustworthy than the readings that we have in the other manuscripts. Because okay. they just come from a, a later, more redacted uh, stage of uh, history of the text. Um, so, let's see. I'm just going to skip that difference. There's, just, there's many differences, but some of them are not as significant as others. Okay, we're going to go to Well, here's here's a uh, the Septuagint often adds like extra like references to Elohim or God that's not in the other versions. So, for example, in chapter 3 verse 12 what it says in the Masoretic text, chapter 3, verse 12, and the, wait, okay, verse 11, it's a difference, sometimes the, the chapters, the verse numbers differ slightly. Uh, verse 11 in the Masoretic text and the Samaritan and he said the Septuagint of that same clause says and God said to him so it adds the word God and it adds the words to him so just extra details here and we see the Septuagint almost always has these extra details extra details where if you remove those details, it doesn't change the meaning of the passage, but it, it makes it less uh, explicit. It makes it implicit. So it seems to me that the scribes had a motivation to remove words, sentences, or clauses which uh, specified explicit detail and which the scribes felt, we don't really need this to be in the text because even if you remove it, the message is basically understood by the people. Uh, that I think that reasoning explains a large majority of the differences that we see in the in the different manuscripts. It does not explain all of them, but it explains quite a lot of them. And let's see. Let's see verse fourteen of chapter three. Um, says upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat it says in the Septuagint upon thy breast and belly uh, breast and belly so again these are just you could see why would the scribes really care about this it seems like 
uh, the scribes would condense the, the material, condense the text, breast and belly, well, we'll just say belly, uh, just to simplify the text. It, it, I have a hard time seeing why the scribes would add unnecessary details that we don't need to necessarily know. It can just be, it can, th those type of details can be easier explained as scribes removing them as seeming to them to be irrelevant details. So, let's see now. Now we're going to skip to chapter 4. And there's a very interesting difference that it's not just Septuagint and Samaritan, but it's also got the witness of the Vulgate and the uh, Pashida. So it has like four witnesses, and usually the Peshitta and the Ma and, and the Vulgate are very close to Masoretic texts. Should it be in Aramaic? Uh, yes, Syriac Peshitta. And Vulgate is Latin. Latin. It, Vulgate is very, usually it's very close and faithful to Masoretic texts. And the same thing with Peshitta, Syriac uh, Peshitta. But in this instance, all the witnesses are in agreement that, except for the Masoretic text, that there is something missing. And what it is, is where it says, it's, it's, it's ver, uh, chapter 4, verse 8. It says, And Cain, here they, they translate it as, And Cain spoke unto Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field. But it really says, in the Hebrew text, I think it's Amar, it says, and, yeah, it, uh, Amar, the Hebrew word which, it, would be better as and Cain said unto Abel his brother but it doesn't say what he said so they're translating it to try to uh, diminish that that it doesn't make sense like but if they translate if you, if you translate it as Cain spoke unto Abel his brother well that kind of makes sense in English but when the Hebrew word is used Amar it really sounds like it's saying and Cain and Cain said unto Abel his brother, but then it doesn't, it doesn't say. But we've got, in the Samaritan, it says what he said. It says, let us go to the field. Septuagint, it says that. Uh, Lavoga, it says that. The P Peshitta, it says that. And early church father writings, quoting it, also have this uh, phrase. And I even think in some m copies of the Hebrew of Masoretic text, because there's like, there's like hundreds or thousands of copies of Masoretic yeah, text. I think the Masoretic text, some of those copies also have this extra clause here. Uh, but so that's just compelling evidence that the scribes must have accidentally skipped over the line or something uh, and, and left out that clause. And the, the way the Masoretic text is, was uh, created or preserved is that the scribes they all went back to this basic same manuscript text and they whatever that text said they copied it faithfully even if it had errors in it and when you when you if you use a flawed manuscript as the source for all your manuscripts then they're all going to have the same flaws yeah. so that's basically what happened why why the hebrew manuscripts have all these errors it's because they all came from the same uh document now the, now the Masoretic text would have been Codexes as opposed to scrolls, correct? Uh, because codexes had come into being into technology by that time. They had codexes in that time. I think they were still copying out scrolls sometimes, though. So I Maybe think there would be. To the scriptures. Yeah, I think I think they would be using both depending on the concerns of their community or the resources. Or the resources. Yeah. Good now let's see. I'm sorry to interrupt. You. Codex and scrolls. Okay, codex is like. A, book basically okay it was, it was metal they, they had like leather or le uh, lead binding lead with metal bindings and okay. they would actually inscribe oh, the letters wow. upon the lead and it lasted longer too okay yeah whereas the was scroll was that in the dead sea scrolls though was it just scrolls? uh i don't think it was no, in the no, no, no. this is a later technology yeah, things improved. yeah okay things improved. thanks lee let's see they, they they had papyrus in the right. scrolls okay uh, which was different than the scrolls uh Let's see. Another example of like differences in Hebrew text, which you are not usually going to see in translations unless they intentionally try to show you, is like in the Masoretic text it says, 
the voice of thy brother's blood, or damim, are crying to me from the ground. In the Samaritan, it says a singular. The voice of your brother's blood is, or dam, is crying to me from the ground. So, one says dam, the other says damim, singular and plural. There, these are these are differences uh, which are often not made clear to us in English translations. Um, let's see. So is that the same as the difference between Elohai and Elohim? Um, yeah, well, there, there are singular ways of referring to the Creator, like El, uh, Eloa, and then there's also Elohim, which is the plural form. But they're both, they're both singular words, but they, they uh, like, for example, the, the, the animal in Job, Behemoth, it's actually it's a single animal, but it has a plural ending. The uth, behima, yeah, or behima, and it, it's basically the names of creatures or, or or things in Hebrew. They're like they're like it's character descriptions. Uh, hold on, can you say something? Oh, okay, uh, it's character descriptions. So. Uh, so basically, when it says behemoth with the plural form, it's not saying that there's more than one animal. Like, like it's not an animal with two heads. It's it's a it's a single creature with a plural characteristic of its abilities. Or yeah, and that's the same thing with Elohim. It's not saying that there's more than one deity or that there's multiple beings in a council. It's not necessarily saying that it's. It's using a plural form to emphasize the, uh, the 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 pluralness of the character rather than the individual. If, um, if I can interject, you wanna... in Hebrew, the way you know the difference is by looking at the verb associated with it. Like Brashit bara Elohim, Elohim would sound like it's in the plural form, but the verb bara is in the singular. So if 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 he was meaning multiple gods, he would say Brashit Bara Brashit Barim Elohim instead of Brashit Bara. So the verb is what tells us whether that noun in the plural form is like fullness or multiple. Yeah, exactly. You're right. Let's see here. Here's another interesting difference. Is uh, it says. It says in, uh, in chapter 4 in Masoretic, it says, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and she named his son Seth. <coughs> Samaritan says, and he named his uh, name Seth. And then in the next line, it says, uh, and to Seth, to him, uh, wait, no, never mind. I'm not going to read that part. But basically, so you see, there's a difference between he and she. So was it was it Adam who uh, who named it, or was it Eve? Well, that's that's a major difference. Most doctrines are not going to be based on that difference, you know, of who named it. But it's a, I think it is an important uh, difference in the scriptures. Um, let's see. Oh, another example. Like, let's see. When it says, so here's what, how they translate it in the Masoretic text. It says, in chapter 4, it says, And Yahuwah said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall it not be lifted up? And if thou doest not well, sin coucheth at the door. And unto thee is its desire, but thou mayest rule over it. Uh, the Septuagint says, uh, And Yahuwah, God, or Lord God, so it adds the word God, said to Cain, Why art thou become... Uh, wait, let's see. Um, it says, Why art thou become very sorrowful, and why is thy countenance fallen? Hast thou not sinned, if thou hast brought it 
rightly, but not rightly divided it? Be still, to thee shall be his submission, and thou shalt rule over him. So you can see it's that's translated very different. Give me a whole teaching on that, that Genesis chapter four. That that whole passage about sin desiring Cain. Yeah. But you shall rule over it is exactly almost identical to Genesis chapter three. I don't want to offend any women, but when it says. The, the women that the, uh, you shall desire the man but the man will rule over you it's exact, almost the exact same language when sin shall desire you but you will rule over it Teshuka tek, shuk, the, the root of uh, that verb doesn't mean desire as in to want or desire to have it means desire to have that person's position so sin wants your position but, but man is given the authority to rule over sin the woman don't get offended women. the women want the husband's position but man will rule over her that that desire is not desire to be with him that desire is to have his place yeah is anybody offended i'm sorry oh, no. uh -huh. <laughs> well sometimes truth offends but people maybe. sin desires to have your position and authority but you guys got to know we have authority over sin see, or the way that we have been told is that that desire there is desire to want your husband no, that's not it and you all you have to do is compare four and, and three and look at the way that verb is used shuk is the verb shuk is to is to desire but it's not to desire like oh, i want your money <laughs> it's like i want your position of authority sin sin wants our position of authority don't relinquish it uh, yeah, that makes sense. are you leaving for tonight no i'll be back oh, okay i can't find my cell phone and i'm add i gotta go find it okay <laughs> that's i think he might be right on that uh that makes sense to me so uh <laughs> now here's where it gets really interesting uh is Genesis chapter 5 and um, basically that's the genealogy and many people don't find the genealogy is that important but what this is another example of the scribes changing things and it's a it's a major issue because it shows intentional changes these are not accidents these cannot be accidents we have clear compelling evidence that the scribes had an agenda or a specific, specific intention of what they were trying to do to make the scriptures say and basically as i said i don't have a septuagint on me i did a version where i sometimes incorporated septuagint readings so i don't know if anyone has septuagint but otherwise i'm basically just going to tell you and you can corroborate this by looking at the septuagint yourself is that in almost every single instance of the patriarchs for Genesis chapter 5 it says like so for example I'll, I'll read uh, I'll read a so it says Genesis chapter 5 uh, Masoretic Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth and the days of Adam after he begot Seth were 800 years and he begot sons and daughters and all the days that adam lived were 930 years and he died so the structure is he was this many years when he had a son he was this this many years after he had a son and this is the total of the years and when you compare what the septuagint says almost in every single case maybe two different two slightly different ones but otherwise they're all the same where basically uh it's <coughs> The, you compare the Masoretic and the Septuagint, and it says, it says the, uh, however old they were when they had a son, uh, in the Masoretic text, it's exactly a hundred less than the Septuagint. The Septuagint is always a hundred more, and then the remaining years left after are always one hundred more in the Masoretic and a hundred less in the Septuagint and so the totals 
of both the Masoretic and the Septuagint are always the same for the most part in Genesis chapter 5. So that is suggesting that both, whoever changed the text had an understanding that, okay, the total has to be this number, but the chronology seems to be messed up here. So what they did was they, they wanted the math to still add up to the same total, so they removed 100 here, but they, had, they add 100 to the other side, or vice versa. That's the only way to explain it, because it can't be coincidentally like that. It cannot be mistakes that just so happen to be perfectly aligning like that. And uh, when you go through and compare some of these differences, we see that um, we see that sometimes the Samaritan is similar to the Septuagint in some of the numbers, uh, but the Samaritan is the shortest of all the three texts. So basically, when you add up all the numbers, it suggests, in, according to the Masoretic text, the flood happened 1,656 years after creation. If you do that for the Septuagint, you add it all up, it's something like 2,252, something like that, uh, years after creation. That's a huge difference of 600 years difference. And then many manuscripts of the Samaritan, it adds up to 1,308 years or 1,307 years, which is the same uh, chronology that Jubilees follows for the pre-flood. So the Samaritan, uh, the Samaritans only accepted the five books of Moses. They're not going to change the law to make it agree with Jubilees because they didn't consider Jubilees scripture. Similarly, the book of Jubilees, they weren't Samaritans. So they're not going to use the Samaritan Torah to write Jubilees. Uh, so that suggests that it very well may be that what the Samaritan reading of Genesis chapter 5, that it is the most reliable for that chapter. Uh, it basically, you know how people say Methuselah was the oldest one, 969 years. Well, in the, in the Samaritan, he's not 969 years. He's, let's see, Methuselah was 720 years. Uh, Jared, in the Masoretic text, he's 962 years. The Samaritan, he's 748 years. And uh, Lamech. In the Masoretic text, Lamech is 777 years when he dies. The, so that's the Masoretic text. The Samaritan is 653 years. And uh, also, just to, to clarify, the Samaritan readings make it so that Lamech, Methuselah, and Jared all die either in the same year as the flood or the year before. But it's all, it all adds up to that time. Uh, and the significance of th this genealogy is... Uh, it may not seem significant, the differences here, but it actually, I believe, it's a very significant thing because it affects our understanding of history. Um, People have, like, they, they try to date when the Messiah will return and things like that, all based on the chronology here. And if the chronology is wrong in the Masoretic text, this is throwing off all these people's predictions. And secondly, there's also an interesting thing of all these other cultures, all these other nations, they're making claims that their history goes back thousands of years before the time uh, that the, the law says uh, it goes. So it seems to me that the reason for these changes made is not the, not the Samaritan uh, changing it to make it a shorter chronology. It seems like the Jews who were trying to defend their religion had a agenda or motivation to try to make it look like uh, the Bible was trustworthy. It did not contradict history. And so they pushed back the, the length of the patriarchs to a farther time in history so that they, uh, that they could try to convince other people that it could reconcile with history. That seems like a more logical explanation for the discrepancies in my view. Uh, then, let's see, so that, that, that's uh, Genesis chapter 5. Some, oh, and, and you missed it, but basically uh, what I said was 
When you compare the Septuagint with the Masoretic text, in almost every case, except maybe two of them, of the patriarchs, Genesis chapter 5, for the genealogy, like it, it says, uh, this man lived this number of years and he had his first son, and then he lived this remaining number of years, and then his total years was this. But in the Septuagint, it's always a hundred years more of when they had when they had the son, and it's always a hundred years less of how many remaining years. But it's always the same total, so it's clear that can't be a coincidence. It's showing that the scribes intentionally changed the dates, either to make the chronology shorter or to make the chronology longer. And as I suggested, I think the scribes would be more likely to try to make it look longer to try to make it look like the Bible is more trustworthy. That's that's my opinion on that, I believe. Question. Sure. Did they try to change those dates because they wanted Bar Kokhba to be the Messiah, the Mashiach? So what, great question. You know what I'm saying? That is a great question. Because Mashiach was born yes. at 5,000 years, but the rabbis and then tried to make Bar Kokhba be the same number of years, so they tried to change those length of days of the of those of those guys. Uh, that that is a possibility. I think that's something to look into. Uh, I do want to mention something interesting that I forgot to mention is that some copies of the Samaritan of Genesis chapter five almost are exactly the same as the Masoretic text, but instead of sixteen hundred and fifty six years, it is fifteen hundred and fifty six years. So only one of them is different by just 100 years uh, less. Uh, I it was about 300 something. So it may, in, since the Samaritans have some of their copies with like, almost the same as the Masoretic, it may suggest that it was not the rabbis doing that to make it Bar Kokhba because uh, why would the Samaritans have uh, copies of that? Because they, they didn't believe in Bar Kokhba. Uh, the only way that you could be explained is perhaps some of the Samaritans got uh, copies from the Masoretic text uh, at a future time. Uh, that, that's always a possibility. But so I mean, that's that's something to look into. I think, but I'm not convinced that that's what happened. I, I think it's was like about 130 or some years. Something like that. It's like in the yeah. second century A.D. Yeah. Maybe yeah, I think. Century. The big proponent of. Or coach Akiva. Was Akiva. Yeah. Not yeah. a bad fella. Not a bad, not a good so, guy. So, no. He, he's, he's the king of the Talmud. Yeah, he is. Really yeah. He is. I mean, he's the, one of the driving influences. What I'll say is, in my study of the scriptures, the first, or not just the scriptures, but any language in general, the, the first thing to go in accuracy is numbers. Numbers. And then <coughs> name, the second thing to go is names. Names are easily corruptible especially if it's being translated into another language, yep. and then language after language after language. Some texts only are preserved to us after being filtered through many different languages. So imagine, you, you, you know, well, just to give an example, you know, Jesus is very different from Yeshua, or however you pronounce it, because it went through several languages. It went through Greek, Latin, sure. English. But see, so. the ironic thing is, names are not supposed to translate. Names, don't, you can't translate you can't translate Louisette to Chinese. You call me in Chinese and I won't know what you're saying. You still, even if you're speaking Chinese, you still have to call me Louisette because that's the, that's the only name well, I have. Well, it's, um, they could call you. You wouldn't know what they were saying, though. I mean, they could, whatever the Chinese name, you know, I don't, I don't know much about the intonations because it's an intonational-based language, but yeah, they could call you whatever it would be. Have you guys? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say. It's not the same name. Have right. you guys ever seen the King James version Cherubims? Yes. Cherubims. It's like it's so already you a can plural. see right there. Oh, cherubim is already um, plural. There's, so there's a plural being added to the Hebrew because they're not understanding it. Uh, Zamzum names. Um, Zamzum. So what I believe can happen. Is for example in the Greek they actually add endings to form uh, grammatical meaning. Right. Now, if that Greek grammatical uh, ending is part of that name rendered into from the Hebrew into Greek, and then you render the Greek into another language that also adds an ending onto that, mm -hmm. then you've got two endings there. Wow. So it, it could be like that. There could be things like that that could easily make the name corrupted. Uh, 
And then another thing is many languages, the, the, the letters used are ambiguous as to how to say them. Like in English, you know, the, the, our vowels can differ how we pronounce the vowels. Yep. So when people are transliterating it from one language that has already been translated, transliterated into even another language, uh, they might differ in the pronunciation and render it in a very different way. So, uh, so I think from what I've seen in my studies of, of scribal work is that numbers are the first thing to get corrupted, names the second thing, um, as accidents. Uh, or, so, you know, as I said, sometimes there's intentional changes, but it's very easy uh, to accidentally change numbers. Onya? Yeah? Is the um, life of Adam or uh, Noah changed then? I mean, how long they're supposed to live? Or is, uh, in the Samaritan? Oh, how, how long they lived? Yes. Are those two the same? Uh, how this? long most of the patriarchs lived is almost always the same in all the... Because you were saying that witnesses. some of them yes. in Genesis chapter 5 were dramatically different. Right. Some of them, the how long they lived were different, but most of them are the same as to the total length of years they lived. Got it. Okay. So Adam, in all witnesses, lived 930. And Noah, I guess 950. Noah, yep, all witnesses, 950. Got it. Uh, but it's like Yorin and a couple other people. Jared, yeah, Jared, Methuselah, Methuselah and uh, Lamech all have major differences between Septuagint, Masoretic, and Samaritan. And in some of those differences, the Septuagint partially agrees with the Samaritan, like in the single digits or something like that, compared to the Masoretic. So the complex relationship here does suggest that the Masoretic text is not the original, I believe. Yeah, that's um, that's just too bad for all the people who worship the Hebrew language. Well, that's yeah, just, it's it's the, people who worship the the Hebrew Bible as you know the well, that's historically the perfect I mean, word of God. The the Septuagint, not the Septuagint, but the Masoretic was like in one thousand. You know, I mean, it'd be like, um, oh, I can't even think. You know, well, yeah, actually, you know, the Constitution from if it was still going on twenty two oh five or something like that. Said, so, well, that's the original. No, it's not. You gotta go back a little further than that. 1789 or something? Yeah. I don't remember the exact number when it was written, when ours was written. But, you know, you got the same thing going on. You know, 1,000 years, two, 1,200 years difference. Yeah, that's a lot of time and a lot of language uh, crud will pile up and traditions and what someone said or did or how long they supposedly live. Like you said, numbers. I never thought about that. Yeah. Numbers would be the first thing to go because no one will really know the truth. Yeah, it's it's depressing, but at the same time, I, I believe, as I said, I think uh, it's encouraging. It, 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 it can be it can be depressing and it can be encouraging depending how you look at it. And as I said, there's two ways people I have to react. Like, yeah, there's two I, ways people react. One is they just abandon the faith entirely right. because they see these crazy differences. Mm -hmm. The other is okay, <coughs> I see that there's some corruptions, but I'm going to try to figure this out. I'm going to try to to it. yeah you, you it, it takes it takes work it takes effort but i believe it's worthwhile if you're gonna if you're gonna stick with the scriptures then i think we have work to do but uh, in the end it will uh be very valuable unfortunately it would have been great if the dead sea scrolls had preserved this genealogy in the fragments it didn't go there i there was, there was like a fragment that preserves like little pieces of it, but nothing that's preserved uh, preserves any significant differences. Uh, right, are people were they going to bed or? They're going to bed. That's fine. Okay. They keep going. Um, let's see. So. So now I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 6. Uh, I don't know how much we're going to be getting through this. Obviously, I won't be able to do the whole thing of Genesis. But just this is just kind of a, uh, a preview into some of the major differences. Let's see. So Genesis chapter 6. Uh, I, 
Okay, here's a... Let's see... I'm trying to see... Okay. This is a very different... It, it may not be that the Hebrew text was different, it may just be that the translation is different. But, in either case, this is a major difference. And it says... It says, And it repented Yahuwah that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. The Septuagint translates it as... Uh, then God laid it to heart that he had made man upon the earth and he pondered it deeply okay. so it's a different it's a different way of translating it which perhaps it changes the meaning yeah perhaps they translated it because they thought well he didn't repent so let's translate it in a way that uh, undermines that and doesn't make it seem like that or perhaps the Masoretic text didn't translate it properly. I don't know. So those are two possibilities. But it's important to see the different ways it can be translated. Because translations can corrupt the text. It can change the meaning. So that translations are also a key way of uh, preserving or tampering the scriptures. In verse 4, in verse 6, uh, so in verse 4 and verse 6, it's, or, so, okay, let me say, verse 4 it says, Masoretic, and Yahuwah said, Septuagint, and Yahuwah God said, or Yahuwah Elohim. Verse 6, it says in the Masoretic, and God having seen. But then it says in the Septuagint, and Yahuwah God having seen. In verse 9, it says, but Noah found grace before Yahuwah. Mas that's Masoretic. Septuagint. But Noah found grace before Yahuwah God. Verse 14. Uh, it's, it's the same thing. You're going to see the same thing all in like the first 15 chapters of Genesis, something like that. Like the, like the first 15 chapters of Genesis, you're going to see that usually the Masoretic text says one or the other, not both. And the Septuagint usually says both. Which is the original... I don't know, but it's. I think it's important to show us that scribes were not afraid necessarily to add his name into the scripture or to take it out. One of those two. They definitely did that, as this shows. Um, now. Jane, the ladies need to run to town. Um, are you okay staying here? I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. So the ladies need to run to town real quick. Are you okay staying here? <coughs> uh, yeah. How long do you think you'll be going, though? Uh, going well, continue. How long do you guys? I don't want to go too long for you guys. Uh, they're going to bed. It's been going. And then, We've been doing this for an hour and 13 minutes. Uh, Our children are going to sleep. They should, you shouldn't be interrupted by them. It should be fine. Thank you. Uh, what do you think they should do? Well, I mean, I'll come right back here after we get back to get you, so. Yeah, that could be about an hour, couldn't it? It could be, yes. Uh, do you think I should leave? And is there room to go with you? Yeah, yes, ma'am. It'll just be a. It probably. I don't know how long we'll go. So I don't. Know, maybe I if you want. I'd like to stay, but uh, I think. I can always go through with you again some of this material, uh -huh. and we're only going. We're not going to get too far necessarily. Uh, so. I know because when you. There's a lot. You can always I, listen to it on JPS. For oh yeah, and it's I, being I recorded. JPS for that yeah, Abandoned. Yeah. Oh no, I understand. Having to, you know, sit and every. I understand. You need yeah. to all go to bed, and I'm, well, I'm like sitting here, you know. Right. Uh, no, I completely understand. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed what we've discussed. Most definitely. Most definitely. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, that's all right. I, I'm. Just... I'll just wait till. Uh, let's see. The next thing I'm gonna say is. From Genesis chapter six. Yeah, she's not out there yet. Thank you for. <laughs> you for sure. <laughs> you for sure. <laughs> Let's see. Good night, Miss Jenny. I'll just wait. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, thank you so much. Tomorrow. What time did they?
Do we know the schedule for breakfast tomorrow? Yet? No. Well, hopefully uh, everything will be better tomorrow. <laughs> hopefully everything was resolved today. I don't know what's going on, but. Yeah. So I'm going to continue. Uh, so Genesis chapter 6. Here's verse 20. It says, Masoretic here, it says, Of the fowl after... Wait, hold on. Okay, so I'm going to start with verse 19. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. Male and female they shall be of the fowl after their kind and the cattle after their kind from every creeping thing of the ground to its kind two of every kind shall come unto thee to keep them alive now let's see what the Septuagint here says um, it says okay so it was verse again as I said the verse numbers sometimes differ here so what was verse 19 for this is verse 20 for right here. So this one said, And of every living thing of all flesh, the other, the Samaritan, they have it translated as, And of the animals and of all the flesh. It says right here in the Septuagint, And of all cattle, and of all reptiles, and of all beasts, even of all flesh, thou shalt bring by pairs of all into the ark. So it just gives more detail. And you can see why perhaps scribes might have just condensed it to say, and of everything living. Uh, then also, let's see. Um, what verse is this? I'm just going to skip that part. Um, okay, so here's an example of chapter 7, verse 2. I believe it's verse 2. Okay. Um, of every clean beast, thou shalt take to thee seven and seven, an animal and its mate, and of the beasts that are not clean, by two, an animal and its mate. Also fowl, also of the air, seven and seven, male and female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. The Septuagint and the Samaritan, <coughs> the Septuagint and the Samaritan uh, together say, so it says, um, and of the clean cattle take into the seven pairs male and female and of the unclean cattle one pair male and female and of clean uh, fowl of the sky seven pairs male and female and of all unclean fowl one pair male and female to maintain seed on all the earth so it's adding like the clean uh, specification of the distinction between clean and unclean fowl, which is not in Masoretic. Uh, let's see. differences I'll just skip okay well here's an example of relevance to what we were talking about earlier about days and nights uh, it says verse 17 of chapter 7 and the flood was 40 days upon the earth the Septuagint says 
And the flood was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So again, it's things like that, which there are some important differences there. Well, that seems like one of those things where they contracted it. Yeah. Shortened. Right. Because people would assume that days also meant nights. That's right. And, and, our, and if that's not true, that's an example of agenda being added or interpretation being imposed into the text. Right. Okay, so I'm going to chapter 8 now. Okay, so here's what it says. Chapter 8, verse 1, Masoretic. And Elohim remembered Noah and every living thing, and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And Elohim made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged, or subsided, as the other translation says. So basically, here's what it says. It says, he remembered Noah, every living thing, and all the cattle. Why is it only mentioning just the cattle? Like, what, what's the deal with... Why is it specifying just cattle? What about all the other things? The Septuagint says, And God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle and all the birds and all the creeping creatures that creep, as many as were with him in the ark. Mm -hmm. So it goes through the whole thing. Again, it's an example of it seems like they're just condensing it to... Uh, shorten the text just for sake of ease of copying and being lazy yeah being lazy I, that's what i've seen so, not just in genesis but like in every book of the old testament and sometimes new testament books too like you know i don't think it's just the bible i think books of all any uh writing you're considering you're going to see these type of things where it seems like they shorten things for say to copying because imagine you have to copy it out all by hand it's very tiresome it's tiresome what i do with with tech typing it on the computer you know it would have been 10 times worse at least trying to write it all out by hand uh what i can do with a computer in 10 years would have taken like 100 or more years for people to do let's see i might stop with I might stop with chapter 11, I'm thinking. That might be a good stopping place because that also talks about gene uh, genealogy. genealogy thing. And so I'll end there. Uh, let's see. Okay, so here's an interesting thing. Verse 21 of chapter 8. Uh, it says... Wait, hold on. I, uh, I See, what I did was I listened to a translation and, com and compared the Septuagint and tried to mark differences. Sometimes I made mistakes on those comparisons. So I just looked and what I noted here is not correct. So... Um, Okay, so, so chapter 9. Again, as I said, I'm going to stop at chapter 11 after. We'll do 11, and then we'll end it. So here's what chapter 9 says. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, or fill the earth. Uh, <coughs> Septuagint adds, and have dominion over it. And then in... In verse 7, again, the same thing happens. It adds, and have dominion over it. So it's a clear thing when it's being added in both places. It's clear that either the scribe added it in both places, or the scribe removes it in both places. Let me see this. Verse 16, I think. Okay.
Okay, let's check in here. Okay, here's, here's an interesting difference. And the bow shall, shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every soul, living of all flesh that is upon the earth. Uh, the Septuagint says, I will look to remember the everlasting covenant between me and the earth, and between every living soul and all flesh, which is upon the earth. So, so basically the main difference is our text says between God, but it's God himself speaking, but he's referring to himself as God. Can you please read that again? Sure. Uh, it says, the, And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every soul, living of all flesh that is upon the earth. <coughs> Septuagint says essentially the same thing, but instead it's uh, it says... And my bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look to remember the everlasting covenant between me and the earth, and between every living soul and all flesh, which is upon the earth. So what it adds is, Masoretic says, and the bow. So Tudor says, and my bow. And then... So it speaks in the first person and in the third person. Right, there's those differences between first and third person. And we're not, we don't see this just in Genesis, but we see it in Deuteronomy, Temple Scroll, and other writings. So there's some, it's crazy that the scribes would go to these lengths to change the text. It, it, it does suggest that the scribes were not afraid to change what they thought needed to be changed. They were bold enough to do that. And we need to understand that in order to properly figure out what the Bible truly was saying. Because if we have this false idea that the scribes would never have changed things, well, we know from this evidence that that cannot be possible. <coughs> they clearly were bold enough to change things. Here's a, a thing where Jubilees corroborates this edition in the Septuagint. Uh, it says in verse 22 of chapter 9, Masoretic, And Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers without, or outside. So Tuagent says, Ham the father of Canaan stared at the nakedness of his father, and he went out. And he went out, that clause. It's in Jubilees, it's in Septuagint. It's not in, it's not in the Masoretic. It's not in the Samaritan. So we're seeing that Jubilees sometimes agrees with Septuagint, sometimes agrees with Samaritan, sometimes agrees with Masoretic. All this suggests that <coughs> the original version of Torah is much more complex than what we have been led to believe by the church and by Jews. It suggests that something like the Dead Sea Scrolls is the original because when we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, we're seeing the same thing. We see that the Dead Sea Scrolls copies sometimes agrees with Septuagint, sometimes agrees with Samaritan, sometimes it has what Masoretic says, sometimes it has his own peculiar readings that none other has. Um, what about verse 3? Is there any change in verse 3? Of chapter 9? Yes. Let's see. Can you read uh, your <coughs> verse 3? Every moving creature that lives is food for you. I have given you all as for living as green plants. Okay, let's, let's see that. So Masoretic and Samaritan have the same. Septuagint. Verse 3. From what I remember, uh, the Septuagint, like, I, I went through it. I didn't mark any differences there, so it looks like it's the same. But what I can tell you is that I mentioned the other day about Genesis Apocrypha. And in the Genesis Apocrypha, it claims to have a book of Noah. And Noah speaks in the first person, gives his own account of the same stories. Yeah. And it preserves an account of... Uh, these passages, but in a significantly longer version, and it's an amplified version. yeah, it's okay. a, but problem is it's fragmentary in many places. But when you if you read it, you'll just see that 
uh, I don't know. I think I think the longer version still supports what the text says here, but it's uh, it just does show us that if it was Moses or whoever wrote Genesis, they have shortened the original words in a major way, and we're missing a fuller dialogue that was being given, a fuller message to the story. Okay, what I'm saying though is, does that text agree? with uh, the commandment, the new commandment, that he was given to Noah about all food. <coughs> now, the animals now could be considered food for us, certain animals, of course. The Genesis Apocrypha? No, or this, first, or this first here, does it agree with the Dead Sea Scrolls? Oh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. Um, let's see. We've, unfortunately, that chapter was not preserved in Genesis. Ah, uh, of course not. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. I actually, how, how convenient! I know. Yeah. I've actually found like you know, there's certain examples where like, you're it's like you're looking, you're, like you're talking with your friend, and you're saying, "Oh man, wh what does what does this passage originally say?" Oh, let's look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, and then we look, Oops. and like sometimes it's been like, the Dead Sea Scrolls cuts off at the exact verse before <laughs> the verse that we're looking for. You know, it's like. That's oh, right. frustrating. Yeah. So, so for clarity's sake, uh, in the Genesis Apocryphon, does it endorse the idea of animals being food? Uh, I believe it does. I, I can say, you know, if you read it, I think you'll come to the same conclusion that it endorses it. Uh, it, uh, but just in greater detail. What I, what I've seen seems what I have found is that, like you know, with the concept of the Temple Scroll, uh, it seems like scribes actually had were more likely to remove sacrifices or passages about animals than adding them that's from what i've seen uh all, it's like again the laziness aspect and also the fact that if the bible is saying something that makes them look bad or their people look bad or like makes it look like they're in major sin they're going to suppress that uh, and so the fact is if the temple scroll is true uh, the entire priesthood temple service of the second temple is completely uh, in disobedience to the law's requirements and so uh, they're going to have a bias or motivation to try to su suppress that fact to hide it from the people that what they're doing is not really in line with what the law requires in other words they're not inserting their own ideas into the text they're only removing what they don't um, I find that more often than not they're removing things they don't like but as we discussed like you know sometimes what they're removing is almost like it's almost like they're adding their ideas by what they remove like you know the, the, the days and nights thing right. they're removing the nights and that's adding an interpretation yeah. so, <coughs> so that's what I found I, it seems more often than not that the text was corrupted by things being removed Sometimes things were added to try to correct it or make it make sense, but for the most part, what I've been seeing is details removed uh, for various reasons. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to skip chapter 9. We finished chapter 9, and... Uh, there's some differences in some of the spelling in the Hebrew manuscripts of the, the people in Genesis chapter 10. It's the Table of Nations. Uh, one of the interesting ones is Masoretic says Dodanim. Samaritan says Rodanim. That agrees with the Septuagint. And some manuscripts of Masoretic also say that. So we can see in Hebrew the R, the Resh, and the Dalit look almost identical. So this is an example of most likely the scribes just made a mistake of when you write in English the cursive it can be hard to read sometimes the same thing with Hebrew you're, <coughs> you're writing quickly it can look almost identical. But you're talking about the flame letters the Reish and the Dalit could be looking the same. What about in older Hebrew? The Paleo Hebrew I don't think that's the case uh, where they look identical. The, right. the Dalit looks like a a D, it? yeah, it looks like a triangle, which is like the English D, except our D is just like a curved, but otherwise it's like the same, it's like a triangle, mm -hmm. a D, and then 
rish is like a, a hook. It's almost uh, like a backwards R. Yeah, it's, it's, well, it's right from right to left. So the ratios in, in the flame letters, yes, are like a backwards seven, seven, so to speak. But the dollar would be a closed loop, wouldn't it? The dollar in the in the paleo would be the, the triangle, right. whereas the, the 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 more modern Hebrew right. has like straight. it has the straight up, and then it has like the little line on top, and it's slightly oh, pushed okay. over to the right. Like it's sticking out a little bit here. The resh is almost the same, except it's not sticking out. So, so what this the scrolls was written and the Dead Sea Scrolls was written in the flame, though. No? It's written I mean, in it, it's written in both. Uh, some oh. co some copies in paleo, some copies Super in the regular. Okay. But what this shows us, it's a good observation because it's basically showing us when were these changes made? Made when were these errors made? They were not made in the paleo Hebrew. They were made when the Torah was written in these newer characters because that's the only way they could make these <coughs> mistakes so um, the only main significant difference here that I will mention other than that is uh, there's several differences but only name one and that is the mention of Canaan uh, the Gospel of Luke mentions an extra Canaan. Uh, basically, it's, so it's Shem. Then uh, his son was Arphaxed. Then Shelah. Uh, but in the in the Gospel of Luke, before uh, Arphaxed gives birth to Canaan, and then Canaan. Uh, doesn't give birth, but you know, begets uh, uh, Canaan, and then Canaan uh, begets uh, Sheila, and so and that agrees with the Septuagint. Missing generation. Uh, yeah, it's a missing generation. The Septuagint it agrees with, uh, it has that extra, and it also has the extra uh, in Jubilees. So we've got Jubilees with that extra person, <coughs> Gospel of Luke, and. Septuagint. Uh, so these are multiple witnesses pointing to the possibility of an extra generation. And again, this is this is a chronology issue. Uh, it may be that the Canaan was removed because they thought Canaan was cursed and they removed it for some reason. I don't know why though. It's possible it just got accidentally skipped over. Then uh, also another interesting thing to point out is in Chronicles, First Chronicles, you know, it, it gives the initial chronology and in the Masoretic text it also says uh, it gives it gives a full genealogy but it agrees with the Masoretic text of of Genesis uh, in the Septuagint it's missing a huge passage that is in Chronicles in that beginning section um, so it may suggest that the Chronicles text was altered as well to try to make it agree with Genesis. Um, scribes may have done that. One thing I haven't heard you mention yet, I could have missed it, but uh, it seems like Solomon's reign, not Solomon, Saul's reign, is also either different or translated wrong. It's either different in different books or it's translated wrong. Is I think some uh, places it's uh, four years in some places it's 40 years yeah, and I don't know if, I don't remember if it's a difference in a manuscript or a difference in which book it was in but we found that in the Torah portion that uh, Saul was either king for four years or 40 years but, yeah, yeah I, I actually think if I remember correctly uh, some like the, the Hebrew I think says something like he reigned a year or, or something like that it makes it look like he didn't reign long at all and then the New Testament makes it look like it's 40 or something, and I think they're using the New Testament to try to correct the Old Testament, it may be. And I think maybe some Septuagint manuscripts also have yeah. a, an assertion for the date. Um, but what I can tell you is First and Second Samuel, we've got two key witnesses to showing that the Masoretic text is highly inferior 
to what the original was, and that is Septuagint, which has so many extra details. In a similar way to what we're seeing with Genesis and these other books, the, the character and style of the changes made is the same relationship. And also, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a, it's called Samuel Scroll. It's the longest copy of First and Second Samuel found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It has extra passages, and one of the extra passages is mentioned in Josephus, but it's not in any of our copies of the Bible. And yet Josephus says this passage, and without this passage, the story doesn't make sense. It's, it's about the eye being plucked out. It's verse zero, it's called. Yeah. I think it's Samuel, first Samuel chapter 10. I think so, yeah, chapter 10. The, the, the eye, the, there's this guy who's plucking out the Israelites' eyes, but it doesn't, our copies don't explain why he's doing this. But in both Josephus and the Samuel scroll, it gives a, an extra paragraph explaining why. And then the, some, the Dead Sea Scrolls agrees with this uh, Septuagint details, like all these extra details, it's agreeing with it. So, you know, some people before the scrolls were found were accusing the Septuagint translators as adding things everywhere. But these Dead Sea Scrolls are showing that can't be. Crazy. Um, we were talking about the Dalit and the Raish. Even in the Paleo, the Paleo um, Dalit is like a backwards P, but the ends are pointed. Yeah. On the Raish, they're, cir they're, they're curved, but the same backwards P. Oh, so in, in modern Hebrew and Paleo Hebrew, they look like, they look different, but Similar. the letters look the same. Okay. In the, in the Paleo and the letters look the same, but different <coughs> in the Bullshit. modern. So it's like you said that you can do, kind of uh, mistake one for the other in both modern and the flame, modern okay. and the Paleo. So, but yeah. Huh. Thank you. Um, Let's see. Okay, so here's where I'm going to end this, and this is going to be chapter 11. Okay. So this is also a continuation of genealogy. Now, what I have discovered in my belief, I know Matthew isn't quite as sold on Jubilees yet, but... Uh, <laughs> but um, I think it's a fairy tale myself, but, you know... He said fairy tale. Uh, what, what I've seen is that I don't trust Genesis chapter 11 much at all uh, because Jubilees gives a completely different thing than Genesis chapter 11. What it seems to me is that the scribes didn't know what to make of this and they, they changed it, but uh, I believe the Samaritan is the most original form of these three versions. So in other words, I think the Samaritan version of chapter 11 with the one exception of the, they, they remove Canaan, but other than that, I think their version of chapter 11 is the more authentic one. It, most of the time it agrees with the Septuagint in the numbers. Uh, it seems like in chapter 11, the Masoretes or whoever was responsible for the version that eventually became the Masoretic text, they looked at the chronology and saw it didn't make sense. And so they started uh, for chapter 11, they were actually, again, remember I, as I said in chapter five, right. the, the differences are exactly 100 years right. in both places uh, for how many they begot and then how many after. We're seeing the same thing in chapter 11, only this time Samaritan and Septuagint are both agreeing with having an extra 100 and then a fewer 100. So my thought is that the Masoretic text came from this corrupted Samaritan version of an extra 100 years and they were, they slightly edited the, the chapter 5 and they also edited chapter 11 by reducing it 100 years because they thought that the chronology wasn't working. Uh, that, that's what, what I have seen. Because again, it can't be coincidence that it's exactly differing by 100 in each direction so that it can add to the same total. So, again, it's a clear polemic that's going on by the scribes. But since I do accept Jubilees as authoritative, Jubilees is giving completely different numbers. So how, why is that? How can that be? Uh, either Jubilees is just inventing things and writing what it wants to write, or 
Jubilees reflects the original numbers uh, for how old they were when they, when they begot. And this is basically showing us uh, that Genesis in chapter 11 is unreliable. And I think we have, to, we have to consider that possibility. We don't necessarily have to say that has to be the case, but the fact that Genesis chapter 5 has been, has been corrupted in the way I have demonstrated suggests that it very well could have been that all our copies of chapter 11 of Genesis are corrupt. Uh, so here, the one main interesting difference of the Samaritan over the Septuagint and Masoretic in this chapter is what we see is, uh, like you know how I said in Genesis chapter 5, it has that threefold structure. It has uh, how many years old they were when they begot, then how many years left over, and then how many years in total. Chapter 11 doesn't have how many years in total for each of those men in the Masoretic or Septuagint. But in the Samaritan, it does have the total for each one. And I believe that is a key. I believe that Samaritan de extra detail is original and it is a key, which is basically saying that is the original. Because again, remember uh, chapter five of Genesis, most of the time, the totals are the same. So usually it wasn't the totals that were being changed. It was usually the, the numbers adding up to it that changed. And I believe that the Samaritan totals are trustworthy, but it's what's adding up to it that's not trustworthy. That's, that's my belief on that. So anyways, that's... The, the events of chapter 11, though, happened? The, I believe, like yeah. Babel and the confusion of language. <coughs> I believe they happened, yes. I just, just think the, the chronology of the numbers oh, okay. totally screwed up uh, by the scribes. Uh, Give one example if you can. So I'm trying to recall, recall the, but I sure. Okay, so so okay. What would be the results or the consequences of changing the numbers. The, the results would just basically be pushing back history to make it look like the Bible is much older than it was or much younger than it was. Things like that. It's so here. Here's, here's some examples. Okay. So it says. It says, and Shem lived, this is Masoretic text. Shem lived after he begot Arphax said, wait, excuse me, I need to go back to the previous verse. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begot Arphax said, two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begot Arphax said, 500 years and begot sons and daughters. The, the uh, Samaritan adds, and all the days of Shem were 600 years and he died. Next line, Masoretic says, and our facts had lived five and 30 years, 35 years, and begot Shelah. And our facts had lived three years and four, or 34 years, wait, excuse me. No, my, my apologies. Our facts had lived three years and 400 years after he begot Shelah and begot sons and daughters. So that's 403 years after. <coughs> So here's what the Samaritan says. It says, And our facts said lived 135 years. So again, it's the extra 100. And he begot Sheila. And our facts said lived 303 years, not 403 years after he begot Sheila. It still adds up to the same. He begot sons and daughters. And then the Samaritan adds an extra clause saying, And all the days of our facts said were 8 and 30 years and 400 years, and he died. What, what's confusing here is, as I said, in the Septuagint, it doesn't have those extra clauses of the totals, but it does have the extra generation of Canaan. So that is a confusing thing of why both Samaritan and Masoretic don't have the Canaan there. Right. That's confusing. Uh, but so each time it, it goes through that, and the Septuagint usually agree, pretty much always agrees with the Samaritan in the numbers for each of them. But so the which one is it? Um, Cause that sounds that makes sense to me. That sounds to me. Did he live thirty five years? Would be thirty five if you have a child. You won't wait one hundred thirty five well, years to have a child. Mm -hmm. for, right. So verse verse twelve, uh, uh, Masoretic, thirty five years, and the verse twelve is in in uh, Septuagint and Samaritan one hundred and thirty five years. So that's like a lot of years to wait to have a child. Right. So that's exactly the thing. The I believe the Masoretic scribes 
reduced it by a hundred years to make it more make it more sense to them. Yeah. Reader. But say it again. To the reader. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. you're thinking, I guess, also, if we want to believe that things were different, you know, I guess the atmosphere or environment, and, you know, these guys did actually live longer. You know, I don't know. You know, people can argue about if uh, you know Noah actually lived 950 real years and how we see it or something different. Some people do, but you know, I, right. I, I tend to think that he really did. You know, I have no proof otherwise, or right. you know, saying that I'm wrong. So, yeah, uh, basically, I think. Uh, so here's the thing: like you know, he he said uh, that Jubilees. He personally thinks it might be a fairy tale, but even if it was, we have Dead to. Times. Yeah, <laughs> we have to realize that. Like, so let's follow the logic here. Say Jubilees was forged. But what was it forged from? Well, then it must have been forged from Genesis or from Genesis Apocrypha and things like that. So it was using a source text. And apparently the source text it was using had a different chronology in this set, this chapter. Unless he's, Jubilee's writer is just inventing things. But, uh, I mean, inventing the chronology dates. But something against that is, I said, the Samaritan copies of Genesis chapter 5 agree exactly with jubilees and the samaritans would not have a motivation to to follow jubilees because they didn't accept jubilees and jubilees wouldn't have a motivation to follow the samaritan because they probably considered the samaritans heretic <coughs> so i believe that jubilees reflects the original dates of chapter 11 uh samaritan preserves the correct totals but then the just the numbers that are added are just all out of whack, I think. That's that's my perspective. Not 100% proof for that, but that's what I'm leaning towards. Anyways, that's that's pretty much all I wanted to show today. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Any last things you wanted to say before we end this? It's very important. You're welcome. Uh, I'll be sharing more stuff like on uh, Genesis Apocrypha later this week and Temple School. Hopefully I'll continue that tomorrow. Just to clarify my position, sure. I, I think uh, I don't classify Jubilees as bedtime stories, but <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even... Bedtime story has a space in reality. Yeah. <laughs> so, I haven't read the entire thing myself, but when, uh, um, but from what, like, what I understand is Jubilees is way more authoritative than something like Yasher. Yeah, oh, but, and while it seems to align with Enoch a little bit and things, it seems like it disagrees with our current Protestant canon more so than other documents. Yes. Yeah. And so I'm not willing to say that I would take Jubilees over something <coughs> else, but I don't think it's just a whole bunch of made-up stories either. I think it's got some validity, some relevance and some things we should be... It's a worthwhile read. Yeah, and sure. the fact is, you know, if the Bible is corrupt of the books that we have, well, the same thing could be for Jubilees. Yeah. So it, Jubilees could be scripture, but, but it, it could be corrupted. Yeah. From, so. from the book I was reading that Jackson lent me, it was like, uh, Jubilees is like, it can't make up its mind if it wants to be Enochian Judaism or Mosaic Judaism. And it's kind of like torn between the two. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of an interesting book. Yeah, but anyway, thank you guys for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Um, Louis Jackson wanted to speak with you. I don't know if it's urgent.